Chapter 3 of The Game of Life and How to Play It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin. Chapter 3 The Power of the Word. By thy words thou shalt be justified and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. A person knowing the power of the word becomes very careful of his conversation. He has only to watch the reaction of his words to know that they do not return void. Through his spoken word, man is continually making laws for himself. I knew a man who said, I always miss a car. It invariably pulls out just as I arrive. His daughter said, I always catch a car. It's sure to come just as I get there. This occurred for years. Each had made a separate law for himself, one of failure, one of success. This is the psychology of superstitions. The horseshoe or rabbit's foot contains no power, but man's spoken word and belief that it will bring him good luck creates expectancy in the subconscious mind and attracts a lucky situation. I find, however, this will not work when a man has advanced spiritually and knows a higher law. One cannot turn back, and one must put away graven images. For example, two men in my class had had great success in business for several months, when suddenly everything went to smash. We tried to analyze the situation, and I found, instead of making their affirmations and looking to God for success and prosperity, they had each bought a lucky monkey. And I said, oh, I see, you have been trusting in the lucky monkeys instead of God. Put away the lucky monkeys and call on the law of forgiveness, for man has power to forgive or neutralize his mistakes. They decided to throw the lucky monkeys down a coal hole, and all went well again. This does not mean, however, that one should throw away every lucky ornament or horseshoe about the house, but he must recognize that the power back of it is the one and only power, God, and that the object simply gives him a feeling of expectancy. I was with a friend one day who was in deep despair. In crossing the street, she picked up a horseshoe. Immediately, she was filled with joy and hope. She said God had sent her the horseshoe in order to keep up her courage. It was indeed, at that moment, about the only thing that could have registered in her consciousness. Her hope became faith, and she ultimately made a wonderful demonstration. I wish to make the point clear that the men previously mentioned they were depending on the monkeys alone, while this woman recognized the power back of the horseshoe. I know in my own case it took a long while to get out of a belief that a certain thing brought disappointment. If the thing happened, disappointment invariably followed. I found the only way I could make a change in the subconscious was by asserting, there are not two powers, there is only one power, God. Therefore, there are no disappointments, and this means a happy surprise. I noticed a change at once, and happy surprises commenced coming my way. I have a friend who said nothing could induce her to walk under a ladder. I said, If you are afraid, you are giving into a belief in two powers, good and evil, instead of one. As God is absolute, there can be no opposing power unless man makes the false of evil for himself. To show you believe in only one power, God, and that there is no power or reality in evil, walk under the next ladder you see. Soon after, she went to her bank, She wished to open her box in the safety deposit vault, and there stood a ladder on her pathway. It was impossible to reach the box without passing under the ladder. She quailed with fear and turned back. She could not face the lion on her pathway. However, when she reached the street, 
my words rang in her ears, and she decided to turn and walk under it. It was a big moment in her life, for ladders had held her in bondage for years. She retraced her steps to the vault, and the ladder was no longer there. This so often happens. If one is willing to do a thing that he is afraid to do, he does not have to. It is the law of non-resistance, which is so little understood. Someone has said that courage contains genius and magic. Face a situation fearlessly, and there is no situation to face. It falls away of its own weight. The explanation is that fear attracted the ladder on the woman's pathway, and fearlessness removed it. Thus, the invisible forces are ever working for the man who is always pulling the strings himself, though he does not know it. Owing to the vibratory power of words, whatever man voices, he begins to attract. People who continually speak of disease invariably attract it. After man knows the truth, he cannot be too careful of his words. For example, I have a friend who often says on the phone, Do come to see me and have a fine old-fashioned chat. This old-fashioned chat means an hour of about 500 to 1,000 destructive words, the principal topics being loss, lack, failure, and sickness. I reply, no, thank you. I've had enough old-fashioned chats in my life. They are too expensive, but I will be glad to have a new-fashioned chat and talk about what we want, not what we don't want. There is an old saying that man only dares to use his words for three purposes, to heal, bless, or prosper. What man says of others will be said of him, and what he wishes for another he is wishing for himself. Curses like chickens come home to roost. If a man wishes someone bad luck, he is sure to attract bad luck himself. If he wishes to aid someone to success, he is wishing and aiding himself to success. The body may be renewed and transformed through the spoken word and clear vision, and disease be completely wiped out of the consciousness. The metaphysician knows that all disease has a mental correspondence, and in order to heal the body, one must first heal the soul. The soul is the subconscious mind, and it must be saved from wrong thinking. In the 23rd Psalm we read, he restoreth my soul. This means that the subconscious mind or soul must be restored with the right ideas, and the mystical marriage is the marriage of the soul and the spirit, or the subconscious and superconscious mind. They must be one. When the subconscious is flooded with the perfect ideas of the superconscious, God and man are one. I and the Father are one. That is, he is one with the realm of perfect ideas. He is the man made in God's likeness and image, imagination, and is given power and dominion over all created things, his mind, body, and affairs. It is safe to say that all sickness and unhappiness come from the violation of the law of love. A new commandment I give unto you, love one another. And in the game of life, love or goodwill, takes every trick. For example, a woman I know had, for years, an appearance of a terrible skin disease. The doctors told her it was incurable and she was in despair. She was on the stage and she feared she would soon have to give up her profession and she had no other means of support. She, however, procured a good engagement and on the opening night made a great hit. She received flattering notices from the critics and was joyful and elated. The next day, she received a notice of dismissal. A man in the cast had been jealous of her success and had caused her to be sent away. She felt hatred and resentment taking complete possession of her, and she cried out, Oh, God, don't let me hate that man. That night, she worked for hours, in the silence. She said, 
I soon came into a very deep silence. I seemed to be at peace with myself, with the man, and with the whole world. I continued this for two following nights, and on the third day, I found I was healed completely of the skin disease. In asking for love or goodwill, she had fulfilled the law, for love is the fulfilling of the law, and the disease, which came from the subconscious resentment, was wiped out. Continual criticism produces rheumatism, as critical inharmonious thoughts cause unnatural deposits in the blood which settle in the joints. False growths are caused by jealousy, hatred, unforgiveness, fear, etc. Every disease is caused by a mind not at ease. I said once in my class, there is no use asking anyone, what's the matter with you? We might as well just say, who's the matter with you? Unforgiveness is the most prolific cause of disease. It will harden arteries or liver and affect the eyesight. In its train are endless ills. I called on a woman one day who said she was ill from having eaten a poisoned oyster. I replied, Oh no, the oyster was harmless. You poisoned the oyster. What's the matter with you? She answered, Oh, about nineteen people. She had quarreled with nineteen people and had become so inharmonious that she attracted the wrong oyster. Any inharmony on the external indicates there is mental inharmony. As the within, so the without. Man's only enemies are within himself, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Personality is one of the last enemies to be overcome, as this planet is taking its initiation in love. It was Christ's message, peace on earth, goodwill toward man. The enlightened man, therefore, endeavors to perfect himself upon his neighbor. His work is within himself to send out goodwill and blessings to every man, and the marvelous thing is that if one blesses a man, he has no power to harm him. For example, a man came to me asking him to treat for success in business. He was selling machinery, and a rival appeared on the scene with what he proclaimed was a better machine, and my friend feared defeat. I said, first of all, we must wipe out all fear, and know that God protects your interests, and that the divine idea must come out of the situation. That is, the right machine will be sold by the right man to the right man. And I added, don't hold one critical thought toward that man. Bless him all day and be willing not to sell your machine if it isn't the divine idea. So he went to the meeting, fearless and non-resistant, and blessing the other man. He said the outcome was very remarkable. The other man's machine refused to work and he sold his without the slightest difficulty. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which spitefully use you and persecute you. Good will produces a great aura of protection about the one who sends it, and no weapon that is formed against him shall prosper. In other words, love and goodwill destroy the enemies within oneself. Therefore, one has no enemies on the external. There is peace on earth for him who sends goodwill to man. End of chapter 3. Recording by Amy Conger.